Hello. Uh, good morning. So uh, the first uh, talk of this morning is by Rajesh. He'll be telling us about understanding Melin Bootstrap. Okay, so um, uh, good morning, everyone. And I'll uh, try to, um, uh, uh, what I'll try to do is uh, try, uh, explain some of the ideas and uh, simplifications of uh, uh, a slightly different approach to the conformal bootstrap, uh, the Melin bootstrap, uh, uh, which uh, with um, uh, 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 which we uh, uh, introduced in this uh, work with uh, uh, Aninda Sinha and uh, Apratim Kaviraj Kalol Sen. Uh, but uh, I will uh, review some of that, but uh, I'll talk about some other things we have been doing to, uh, uh, with Aninda to, uh, to understand better uh, this, uh, uh, this relation and uh, uh, some of the subtleties, and uh, it's also its relation to the more conventional bootstrap uh, uh, approach. So the, uh, uh, everything has still not settled, but I'll try to uh, explain uh, 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 some of the uh, the basic ideas and uh, uh, and also illustrate it. Uh, in a particularly nice, a simple example, uh, um, <laughs> the connection with the uh, more conventional bootstrap and ideas uh, 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 of uh, ba uh, based on the paper of Himska, Polchinski, uh, et al. So, um, uh, so what I'll um, uh, first do is explain some of the. Uh, simplifications of the Mellon formalism in uh, uh, in uh, uh, which uh, will play an important role. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, so uh, the Mellon formulation uh, uh, exhibits many aspects of uh, CFT amplitudes in a very uh, nice and transparent way, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, so in the first part of the talk, I'll try to uh, to uh, to review some of that, and also then the ideas uh, uh, of the Mellon bootstrap itself, and finally, as I said, I'll illustrate some of the uh, uh, the connection with some of, uh, with the more conventional bootstrap, at least in a particular example. So. Um, so the Mellon uh, approach to uh, conformal field theory uh, basically starts from a, sort of a Mellon transform of the uh, uh, conformal field theory four-point function. Well, it, uh, you can do it for any endpoint function, but we'll stick to the conformal four-point function, and in particular the piece uh, which depends on the to cross ratios, u and v, or uh, you can, of course, think of z, uh, these as the z and z bar that appeared in Simon's uh, talk. Uh, they are just, uh, 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 they're all simply algebraically related to each other. So the Mellin transform of, uh, uh, of these amplitudes is, uh, is a sort of um, conventional Mellin transform uh, with respect to these variables u and v, uh, and uh, you and you define the Mellin amplitude uh, in this way uh, with uh, uh, conventional uh, piece that you pull out in being, uh, with sort of a kinematic piece, and then you have uh, the uh, what we call the Mellin amplitude, or sometimes the reduced Mellin amplitude, uh, etc. This is a piece which is useful to uh, to pull out, and uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but uh, and maybe I'll and we'll we'll see that as we go along. Uh, but so that I don't have to write this all the time, uh, I'll just call this some kind of a measure factor. So the Mellin amplitude is defined in a uh, in this in this way, and uh, uh, it's a function of the, so this is as I said the reduced Mellin amplitude. It's 
uh, it's a function of two variables, s and t, and this s and t are chosen. Uh, the, the terms uh, indicate that a close relation to the usual s and t variables. Uh, but I must warn you that my conventions here for s and t uh, can differ from those uh, adopted by uh, others by factors of two. And in fact, uh, uh, the t variable my, uh, is probably what others call s plus t and so on. But uh, anyhow, uh, uh, I'll adopt this set of conventions. So this s and t are meant to remind you of the Mandelstam variables. Uh, and indeed, in a certain flat space limit, uh, of conformal field theory amplitudes, they do go, they are proportional to the Mandelstam uh, uh, invariance. And uh, so this M of ST has a number of nice properties uh, in general, and uh, I won't have the time to explain uh, all of them. Uh, yeah. A fixed uh, real number? Uh, yeah, so you choose this contour in such a way that you pick up an appropriate set of poles. And the, uh, and the amplitude. So I, I won't have time to explain many of the features of the Mellon amplitude that you can show in general, but uh, I'll just say it's a, uh, for a general CFT, it's, it's a meromorphic function. It has a set of poles uh, which correspond to the physical operators that are exchanged uh, and uh, uh, and many other properties, but uh, for the moment, this uh, let me just uh, state this. Uh, uh, the nice thing about writing in this Mellon amplitude is that many of the structures that you conventionally come across in uh, a CFT have a much simpler form in Mellon space. So, uh, for instance, the conformal block Uh, uh, the conformal block, uh, which is labeled by the representation, the spin representation, and the conformal dimension. Uh, um, uh, uh, this, uh, in position space, is known explicit. I mean, it's known in a power series expansion, but in in a nice close form in two and four dimensions. But otherwise, uh, uh, not. Uh, not uh, in any very explicit form. Uh, um, uh, but, uh, by the way, the superscripts that I will use uh, will refer to the channel. So this refers to the S-channel conformal block when you're, uh, when you're uh, taking the uh, operators 1 and 2 together in a four-point function labeled by 1, 2, 3, 4. You take the operators 1 and 2 together, and then uh, the uh, the conformal block in that channel uh, is what I'll denote by this. So this, under this Mellin transform, so this is a transform, so any function of u and v, you can, uh, will have a corresponding uh, Mellin transform, and, uh, 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 and so I'll denote um, the Mellin transform of the block by B, which is uh, essentially uh, um, B, uh, B de denotes the conformal block. I haven't written, uh, uh, so I I've written it out over here. I, I don't want you to uh, to uh, to process too much of this, but uh, except firstly to note that it is very explicit. It is given in terms of some gamma functions uh, over here. Uh, uh, the gamma functions. Uh, uh, have the property that uh, uh, that uh, they uh, they have poles. Um, uh, the gamma function has poles in this s variable, which is the s channel we are looking at. It has poles in the s variable uh, at uh, the uh, twist of the operator, which is exchanged delta minus l by two, and also and the shadow uh, poles. So the shadow is. If you have an operator delta, then uh, the shadow operator is the one with dimension uh, d minus delta. And this 2h is the notation which is used for uh, h is half the space-time dimension. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, so it has poles uh, at uh, a twist and it's sort of uh, integer descendants. Uh, and there are, uh, there are, uh, mm, uh, as the sa a shadow set of poles as well, but uh, 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 there is this exponential factor uh, which cancels off 
these poles because you want this to be the conformal block which exchanges just the operator delta and not its uh, shadow. So this factor here, uh, you, it doesn't matter if you can't read the arguments, but it's essentially exactly the one such that it has a zero whenever this has a pole. Uh, uh, it's an exponential factor. Uh, and finally, this piece is what is sometimes called a Mac polynomial. It's a polynomial. Uh, in the variables s and t are of degree l, uh, uh, the uh, spin uh, which is exchanged. And it is known in explicit form. It is a kinematical polynomial, uh, uh, which uh, uh, you can write out all the coefficients of. Uh, so, so the form is very simple, uh, as you can see. And it's uh, uh, known in any dimension. You can write it out very uh, uh, explicitly. So as I said, it has, so the features are that it has poles uh, at s equal to uh, tau by 2 plus n, tau is delta minus l, the twist, uh, and um, uh, and the shadow poles are cancelled. And finally, the last thing I want to point out here is that there is a factor, gamma square factor in the denominator which uh, when you put it in over here, it cancels this gamma square factor in the measure. And that's important because uh, you don't want, uh, when you do this integral, you pick up the poles uh, from this Mellon amplitude, and you want to uh, pick up really the poles corresponding to the physical operator delta, which is exchange. By the way, sorry, I forgot to mention this is the four-point function of, let's say, the operator phi. Uh, so phi, 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 phi. This is the irreducible part, and delta phi is its dimension. So, uh, and delta is, I'll use delta for the dimension of the exchanged operator in, in any channel. Uh, and delta phi will be the dimension of the external operator. Uh, so, uh, uh, so that has poles uh, at, uh, so this, uh, this piece has poles um, uh, at the physical operators, but there's a danger that you might pick up uh, um, extra poles from here in the S channel, uh, but, uh, uh, but the block has a factor which is uh, which precisely cancels that out. Uh, um, so, uh, and by the way, these, um, yeah, okay, uh, I'll, uh, yeah. This is the full amplitude. This is just a definition. Uh, you can apply it to any function of the cross ratios, in particular the full amplitude, as I've written over here. But then you want to, of course, split it into, uh, let's say, in position space, you would write it in the S-channel as a sum over the contributions from the conformal blocks in the S-channel. So you can do the same over here. And what I'm saying is that the individual pieces in the Mellon space are given by these blocks which have a explicit form. Uh, yeah, meaning uh, you can, there are, uh, the, the, uh, you, you can add some uh, completely uh, analytic pieces, uh, but which will not change any of the physical uh, results. So, um, um, uh, uh, so that's one. Uh, uh, so uh, the uh, uh, so that's one simplification uh, that uh, you already see when you go to Mellon space. Uh, similarly, something that will be very important for us will be the Witten diagram, uh, uh, and this is the usual S-channel Witten diagram, but now. Uh, it's some, so the operator, so again, it's the operator delta phi in the external legs, uh, but delta in the exchange. Uh, um, so this is one, two, three, four. Uh, and you have, uh, uh, um, 
uh, the, the Witten diagram for this, which involves you know, the usual integrals over the bulk to boundary propagators and bulk to bulk propagators, and so on, are uh, very, uh, not very explicit uh, in general. When in some cases, they can be expressed in terms of these D functions, but, uh, but in general, it's a big. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to work with in position space uh, for general uh, values of the dimension and delta and L. Um, but, uh, uh, but in this Mellon uh, uh, version, and uh, I'll denote the Mellon amplitude. Uh, so this is some uh, script M, but this is just uh, 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 the simple M width and the subscripts delta and L again denote that it involves an exchange uh, uh, by this operator of dimension delta and spin L. Uh, so this, um, uh, uh, this can be written down again explicitly, and I've written it uh, in... Um, uh, so there are two uh, there are two uh, ways of writing it, which are uh, uh, so this is a little bit of a technical point, but uh, it, it may be useful to keep in mind. There are uh, the, uh, there are two ways of writing this uh, um, uh, this amplitude uh, with an amplitude in Mellon space, which is uh, which have complementary advantages. One is to write it in a so-called spectral representation, and that's what I have written over here. Uh, uh, and this is what we originally employed in our uh, paper. So the spectral representation is essentially one in which uh, you are writing it as an integral over what are called conformal partial waves. It's, uh, it's the expansion in, uh, if you wish, the principal series of the conformal group. And the principal series of the conformal group is labeled by, uh, uh, by operators of complex dimension, uh, H plus uh, I times nu, uh, 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 H plus a purely imaginary piece. Uh, so, so these are not the physical dimensions, but uh, uh, but this is what allows, as was also mentioned uh, earlier, the this, uh, the conformal partial waves give you a very natural, complete set of uh, 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 bases to expand the conformal group amplitudes in. So, there's a, a way of writing the uh, Witten amp. Uh, the Witten amplitude in the explicitly in the conformal uh, partial wave basis. So I should have said this is uh, this is the conformal partial wave. This conformal partial wave, as you can see, is very close to what appeared in the block. Uh, it has this factor, which is what I call this omega. It depends only on S. And then it has this Mac polynomial. But now the Mac polynomial is indexed by this parameter nu, which takes complex values uh, here. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so it's an expansion in terms of uh, this is the basis, the conformal partial wave you're expanding in. And this is... Uh, what's called the spectral function. Uh, so it, uh, at least for this particular object, it gives you the spectral density, uh, uh, yeah, uh, spectral density uh, 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 for, the, uh, for the Witten amplitude. And uh, 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 so there's a way to write uh, this explicitly in, in terms of conformal partial waves in uh, in this melon space with a uh, with a uh, very explicit uh, spectral density so the spectral function uh, uh, has the property that its poles uh, correspond to the operators which are really exchanged. So again, uh, the virtue of writing it in this principal series expansion is that uh, when you do the new integral, and uh, the, you can do the new integral by picking up 
the poles in the spectral function, and uh, those correspond then to, uh, so when you evaluate, when you pick up those poles, you will be, you will, uh, uh, you will pick up precisely the conformal blocks uh, um, uh, with those particular values corresponding to the pole, so, and the residues will be the sort of uh, the, um, the coefficient uh, uh, with which the uh, with the which the op coefficient with which uh, that uh, particular block appears, uh, and uh, um, so the spectral function contains. Uh, information about the physical poles um, uh, that uh, correspond to any given amplitude. Here we are not taking the full amplitude. You can write down a spectral function for the full amplitude, and that's the thing that, for instance, is given by uh, by the uh, uh, by the Lorentzian formula of Simon. Uh, but here I'm restricting to us uh, to a uh, to an object which is just uh, uh, the spectral function for a given conformal block and for a given conformal block um, the spectral function has just a um, uh, simple set of poles which correspond to so this set this is a pole which is the one which corresponds to the block and its shadow uh, and the blo uh, the uh, yeah Oh, blue chalk you can't see, uh, I see. So let me highlight the poles, which are the important part. Is this better? Uh, delta minus h, the whole square, minus nu square. Uh, so this uh, has poles at delta equal to h plus or minus nu. Uh, um, and so that's the... Uh, mm, uh, 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 and so, so that corresponds to the uh, the. Um, so the, uh, these are on the real axis, new on the real axis. So you pick up these poles. Uh, well, when you do the contour, you'll pick up either the pole or, in this case, you uh, the uh, the the pole corresponding to H plus new, and not the shadow pole, which will be on the uh, other side typically. And then there are poles here, which let me also uh, highlight. Uh, and there's a shadow version of this. Uh, so this has poles at h plus nu, um, let's say h plus nu minus l by 2 equal to, uh, equal to 2 delta phi. Uh, uh, so, uh, so these are what are called the double trace poles. Uh, corresponding to uh, operators whose dimensions are uh, 2 delta phi. And we know that in a Witten diagram like this, uh, if you expand the Witten diagram like this, uh, and let's say in position space, if you were to expand in conformal blocks, you have contributions not only from the conformal block uh, um, uh, with uh, dimension delta and L, but you also have uh, contributions from the conformal block uh, with dimension 2 delta phi. Uh, uh, so that's uh, uh, a feature of the Witten block, which was very important in studying the anomalous dimensions, and so on, and I'll come back to that. Uh, so you see that uh, this spectral function has that property. It has uh, poles at uh, uh, these double trace uh, values, 2 delta phi, and that's what this piece of the spectral function uh, uh, determines. There's, by the way, a sum here uh, for a fixed L. There's a sum from zero to L, and then what I've written here is the leading piece uh, corresponding to the uh, uh, L prime equal to L value. Uh, the ones uh, there are subsidiary ones which cancel out some other spurious poles that are here, uh, for instance. But so that won't play a role. So I won't. Uh, uh, talk about that. This is the piece which contains the physical information. Uh, this spectral function contains the physical information of what poles are exchanged. Is this clear? Uh, yeah. One is supposed to get uh, something which is very close to the Mellin block or the Switten block. If you just take the. Uh, if you take the B yeah, and, and write, write it, it as sum over poles. Of physical over there, uh, above, yeah. Yeah. So, but that will just give you the. Uh, uh, oh, um, yeah, yeah. So it's true that um, this M and B both have the the set of poles that they have. 
uh, the whole the function b and uh, here the set of poles they have are just the physical poles and they have the same residues or we can normalize them so that they have the same residues but, but as you mentioned there is a an additional set of pole which yeah, is the double. So this is a little confusing perhaps, but that's why I wrote it in this form because this actually gives the physical, uh, the spectral function actually captures the, the actual physical poles that are there in the full, or the, the operators that are exchanged in the full block. Like I said here, uh, you have not only, you, you, you must reproduce from Mellon space or whatever, the, uh, not only the conformal blocks of delta and L, but also the double trace. So how do you do that? You're right that this piece will have only the same poles as this. But the Mellon amplitude has this additional piece, which also has poles. As I said, when you have a conformal block, there are zeros here in this, and the Mellon amplitude for the conformal block has additional zeros which cancel off this poles. But this one does not have those zeros which cancel off, the, uh, cancel off these poles. And that's why when you do the full integral, you'll get, in fact, precisely at s equal to 2, I mean, s equal to delta phi corresponds to the uh, h equal to 2 delta phi. So you get double trace poles. So that's why, in a sense, this piece is what, uh, um, this piece has the nice feature that it captures the contribution of the double trace poles in a in a, in a certain kinematic way, uh, and uh, 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 so the uh, uh, so the M does not have those poles, but this has those poles. But nevertheless, you can infer from the spectral function that the spectral function uh, actually has those poles. I can, it's a little technical, I mean, it's a little confusing, but, uh, but there's no, uh, what you said is compatible with this, because the spectral function is what enters here. And then you have to do this, uh, this thing. So you, uh, uh, what you essentially find is that these poles will cancel off with these zeros and so on. So, so at the end of the day, the poles in S match. Yeah. So you see, there's an omega s nu which has these factors. So, uh, so they they those will ca they cancel out. So in the end, m will have just the same poles as b, but b has additional zeros, which means that these poles uh, can contribute uh, to m, uh, but not to b. Uh, okay. And that's why uh, that's why this has only one block, but in position space. This is just up to some normalizations, g delta v plus some of sort of 2 delta phi plus n, all these double trace operators, uh, 2 delta phi plus n plus l, uh, um, with some coefficients. You, you, uh, so the Witten block has these additional double trace pieces. And uh, all I wanted to say is that the spectral function actually shows that uh, it, uh, it exhibits that. Uh, yeah, so B was in the whole thing. But here in the spectral function itself, when you do the new integral, you will pick up only one set of poles because the shadow poles will lie on the sort of other side of new. Of how you yeah, you close the contour in, in the appropriate direction. Okay, so this was uh, sort of kinematical, and uh, uh, and I um, well, yeah, uh, I want to uh, to write down one more uh, expression. I wrote so uh, so this was, if you wish, one expression for the. Mellon amplitude, which exhibits some properties, which is useful uh, uh, for uh, for for things like this, uh, for exhibiting the double trace. But you can actually, uh, and this is something we uh, um, uh, which uh, we realized, we, we one can actually uh, explicitly carry this out in many cases, and uh, and. Uh, um, you can write an explicit form for uh, uh, for this in terms of a three f two function. Uh, uh, there's a three f two function whose arguments are uh, so. 
So never mind most of the stuff. Uh, it's a hypergeometric function. What is important is that uh, it, it has uh, it, it has its s dependence. So, uh, so firstly, its t dependence is through this Mac polynomial, which is a polynomial in S and T, and the s dependence comes in essentially through this. This factor is uh, just uh, this whole thing together with this factor. Uh, uh, I mean, you can see from the even from the simple definition of the 3F2, that because this argument uh, the, uh, of the 3F2 is the same as this up to a 1, it has simple poles precisely at these physical values. So this is what Abhijit was saying earlier. The physical, the poles of this M are the same as those of, uh, it ha this is the same set of poles that appear over here at s equal to delta minus L by 2 uh, uh, plus an integer. You have the same set of poles here, and if you normalize it correctly, the same residues as well. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, but, the, uh, uh, but unlike this function, uh, this has uh, additional zeros, which are the ones which uh, cancel off uh, over here. So anyhow, this is this explicit form is useful sometimes. It is also useful to see the large S behavior, large S and T behavior of these amplitudes, these individual blocks, because you can look at the you know how the 3F2 function behaves as a function of S and T. And so in a sense, this behaves essentially like s to the l minus 1 for large s t. If you take s and t very large in an equal way, uh, uh, then essentially you get uh, something which behaves like s to the l minus 1, which will be, uh, which will be uh, important. In, uh, uh, so each of the individual blocks, uh, individual bitten pieces, actually has a uh, a growth which is something like this. Um, okay, so anyhow, so this were the kinematic ingredients, uh, uh, and um, um, excuse me. Yeah. So uh, in that three F two, the last argument is one only one. Yeah, that's the uh, hypergeometric function evaluated at. Uh, usually, you write it as a function of the uh, variable z, which now it's set to one. Yeah. So, so the dependences are actually. Uh, are in the arguments or the parameters of the four, uh, 3F2 rather than in the... So uh, I was thinking that uh, this will converge for like, uh, means uh, the convergence of this function, does it put any constraints? Depends a little bit, yeah. There is a, uh, this thing on, uh, 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 on the sum of these being greater than the sum of these and so on. Uh, so there are ranges where you have to be careful and use other analytic continuations of the 3F2 function. So, um, okay, so this was um, the preliminary, yeah. What do I learn? Uh, so, uh, this will be important when I talk later about, uh, uh, I mean, the whole amplitude, uh, so, uh, so this is just telling you that uh, individual pieces of the Witten diagrams actually grow in some, uh, polynomial way, uh, but uh, wh wh where this will be important is in uh, trying to put constraints on the full amplitude, which you expect will grow maybe only as s uh, uh, at large uh, at large s. So, uh, so the so in some sense the uh, uh, the, the the sum uh, the full amplitude the coefficients have to be constrained in such a way uh, that it's bounded for large s. And this is, again, similar to what Simon was saying about uh, the uh, behavior of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the full amplitude. Individual pieces, so these will be sort of, even in a ADS-CFT, when you expand in terms of these written diagrams, the, these are the individual pieces. Each of them individually have very bad behavior, but the sum has to, uh, uh, to have a good, uh, yeah, we are taking S and T to be equal, so keeping the uh, fixed angle scattering, this is uh, not, no, no, it's not the rate when we keep, say, T fixed and um, S large. 
So, um, so the uh, so the idea is uh, of the Mellon Bootstrap is that we expand things in terms of uh, these Witten diagrams um, in S, D, and U channels in a crossing symmetric way. Um, and uh, uh, as we'll see, we will also need a contact Witten diagram about which I'll uh, say something soon. Uh, uh, so S, uh, this is the S, and these are the T and the U, and this one is the uh, kind of a contact diagram, and I'll, uh, I'll talk about that uh, soon. But uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and so the uh, idea is that uh, uh, you you uh, impose crossing symmetry from the beginning, and you um, uh, expand the amplitude in uh, uh, this set of functions where delta and L uh, are over all the primaries uh, of the theory, uh, and. Uh, 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 so crossing symmetric uh, uh, symmetry is manifest, uh, but what is not manifest is that uh, this sum may have additional spurious uh, poles, or rather this uh, rho times this can have additional spurious poles, uh, which are coming from these uh, double trace operators, uh, uh, and you demand that those cancel out. So rho delta phi, uh, this amplitude times m of st should only have uh, physical poles. Uh, or in other words, all the contributions, uh, if you think in back in position space, um, each of these terms will give you double trace operators, if you, let's say, expand it, uh, just like I uh, mentioned how uh, the S-channel written diagram uh, expands in this way, the T-channel written diagram, uh, also when you expand it in, let's say, the S-channel, you will get, uh, get some over uh, uh, these double trace operators, and similarly for the contact diagram uh, as well, all of them will give you pieces which are uh, uh, like this, and, uh, uh, and in general, if there is no operator in the theory which has dimension 2 delta phi, no physical operator with dimension 2 delta phi plus n, then those are uh, unphysical poles of the uh, unphysical contributions, so you want to, uh, to ensure that these cancel when you sum over the whole spectrum uh, with the appropriate OPE coefficients. So, um, so that's the, uh, uh, so the idea is that, uh, yeah. The free theory is not going to be a part of this. Uh the free theory, you uh, no. Uh, so th uh, there are cases where you do have uh, uh, operators with two delta phi. In which case, you separate out that contribution, which yeah, is, is either because uh, yeah, you you separate out that contribution, and the rest of it is unphysical. So typically, you know, uh, in a free theory, you know it comes just from the disconnected pieces. You get a contribution like that, you, and in fact, so in the identity contribution, you separate that piece out, uh, and then the rest of it should cancel. Uh, similarly, in, uh, it might happen in some supersymmetric theories, there might be operators, at least for the chiral primaries, which uh, 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 you, you have that, and in many of those cases, you know that explicitly, because there are short multiplets, you know the contributions. Uh, uh, to the uh, amplitude, and you 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 separate that out, and then the rest of it uh, is what you. Uh, so uh, these are the main examples where you have operators with exactly 
dimension two delta phi uh, plus an integer. Uh, there are uh, there's the one over n expansion where there are operators with dimension nearly two delta phi plus n, and I will talk about that uh, soon in the context of this Himskirk Polchinski kind of work. Uh, so, um, uh, so the uh, so uh, so the statement that these should have uh, only physical poles is the statement that uh, the Um, the sum over the spurious poles at s equal to two delta phi uh, plus n minus l by two. Uh, um, delta phi plus 2n minus l by 2. Um, uh, so these, uh, the sum over these spurious poles, uh, uh, which correspond, uh, which you can think of as double trace operators, uh, the, with phi box to the n, Uh, uh, in a free theory, these would be the uh, uh, the operators which have uh, uh, the, uh, this dimension, two delta phi uh, plus two n plus l. Sorry, the, the, at the poles will be at s equal to two delta phi plus two n by two, which is delta phi plus n, and they correspond to uh, to operators with delta equal to 2 delta phi, which are these operators, I mean, uh, roughly speaking. So, um, uh, so these sum over these spurious poles at s equal to delta phi plus n must cancel. Uh, uh, the sum meaning over delta and l and we do the, the full sum so that each individual piece will have a contribution because uh, each individual piece will be, let's say, something like this. Uh, and it will have a, uh, uh, it will not in general uh, have a zero at s equal to delta phi, which will cancel off the contributions from these, uh, these double poles. Uh, uh, but the, Condition is that when you sum over the whole spectrum with the right coefficients, then the uh, then there must be. In fact, there are the spurious poles. Both there's a double pole and a single pole. Because there's a double pole. Uh, this gamma square uh, has a double pole, so you need to. Uh, if there, were, if m did not have any zeros uh, at s equal to delta phi plus n, there'll be generally a double pole piece, and then there'll be a subleading single pole piece. So you want both to cancel, so that you don't have any contributions from uh, um, uh, from these double trace operator, these so-called what would be double trace operators. So, um, uh, uh, so, uh, so this is the. Uh, so I'm not. Uh, maybe many of you might have heard some of the talks before on this. So I don't want to. Uh, so this is just to briefly recap that. Uh, but uh, all I wanted to say at this stage about this was uh, that uh, um, uh, initially. So then we applied this to the epsilon expansion. Uh, and uh, we were able to reproduce many of the anomalous dimensions to order epsilon cubed, and uh, even for the first time, the OPE coefficients. Um, and uh, we could do that there without these additional contact diagrams. 
Uh, and in fact, one could estimate that these contact diagrams would not contribute to, to that order. So one of the obstacles in going beyond was in trying to understand the role of these contact diagrams. Uh, and uh, 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 what I want to do in the, uh, the uh, remaining 15 minutes of the talk uh, is to show why, in general, uh, you will need to add uh, these. And in, uh, by, I'll, uh, I'll illustrate that by a concrete example where to match with the conventional bootstrap, uh, one actually sees that one needs to uh, add these uh, uh, contact diagrams. So that's what I'll, uh, I'll try to do now in the remaining part uh, of this talk. Um, yeah. The unitarity uh, in the uh, in, uh, in this condition, there's no uh, uh, this thing of unitarity. Only if you uh, it is useful in some context where to to use the fact that these coefficients have to be positive, uh, because if you have some of terms uh, equal to zero, then you can individually uh, set them uh, uh, to zero, but. Uh, uh, but otherwise, in general, at this stage, I'm not using unitarity. But in the solutions then uh, that you produced, uh, the epsilon expansion and so on, why is it that uh, only unitarity solutions came out? Well, it's not even clear that uh, for finite epsilon, they are probably not even unitary. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, because you know these evanescent operators and so on are there in the spectrum. So, it's not clear that the, the uh, Wilson Fisher fixed point at finite epsilon is strictly speaking unitary. But I think there is a fixed point mm -hmm. and it's unique. So, so that's what. Uh, so because of. Out. Because, uh, I mean, also. Uh, Which is continuously connected uh, to the free field. Uh, yeah. Because the space of uh, non unitary theories is probably very large. In, I mean, if, you, if one just imposes the crossing equation, uh, then uh, in that space, uh, how is the direction being chosen? Well, there, I must say there are some mild things we use from unitarity, meaning we do uh, in the course in the epsilon expansion, we do use the unitary bounds on the dimensions of the operators. We don't necessarily use positivity always of the coefficients, but we do use uh, unitary bounds. We use the fact that the stress tensor has dimension d, uh, uh, etc. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, and conserve currents uh, uh, obey the uh, obey the bound. But um, uh, um, uh, that's necessary for uh, ruling out to to sort of it, it again appears in a mild way because it's more for showing that there are no other operators that can contribute in this sum. Uh, it's not used in a very strong way. So I suspect that uh, just some sm mild assumptions are enough to single out the wilson fisher fix point. Okay, so uh, let me uh, uh, now uh, apply this Mellon bootstrap and uh, try to connect it to the conventional bootstrap in the context, in a context which maybe some of you are uh, familiar with, which is the work of uh, Himskak, Polchinski, Penedones, and Sully, I think. Um, uh, um, so let me tell you what they did. So they considered uh, uh, they considered uh, the I mean, their motivations were very different, but as uh, we'll see, uh, some of the things, uh, I mean, they were, they were after a different goal, but some of the things that they, uh, they derived, you can see how to see that uh, here, and it will illustrate some features about uh, uh, these contact diagrams. So, uh, so this considered uh, a bulk, C uh, so uh, what they wanted to show was uh, 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 consider CFT, which uh, with a sort of a Z2 scalar. Uh, uh, so um, and uh, 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 only operators uh, built. 
from this. So in some sense, like these double trace operators, but now physical double trace operators uh, 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 exchanged. And uh, uh, so uh, they considered an amplitude. Uh, if you have an amplitude in which uh, a four-point function uh, of these phi's in which uh, the maximum has been exchanged uh, is L, uh, they, they showed that this is in correspondence with bulk ADS uh, um, so this is a, this is a large n CFD with a, so there's a gap in the spectrum of dimensions, etc. Uh, so um, uh, so what they showed to leading order is that the uh, the conformal bootstrap equations for uh, this theory, which uh, and determine for you the anomalous dimensions uh, of the uh, uh, of uh, these double trace operators. Uh, that uh, so so that uh, information is captured in a bulk ADS uh, dual with local vertices. Uh, 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 local bulk vertices uh, of maximum spin L. Uh, so, uh, so they showed that there's a sort of, uh, uh, they showed that you can, when you have a large NCFT, then you, uh, the, uh, in some ways that is equivalent, the conformal bootstrap conditions uh, are equivalent to those that uh, uh, of a bulk theory. Uh, so a bulk theory is an automatic solution of the conformal, usual conformal bootstrap equations. A bulk theory in which uh, you parameterize the uh, ADS interactions by a set of uh, local vertices uh, and they they put this maximum spin L to sort of uh, give control over the uh, uh, their uh, 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 the matching, but L can be arbitrary, and uh, uh, and it, so it works for general L. So uh, so uh, let me um, uh, so so when, so as I said, they uh, they could show that the anomalous dimensions of the operators here to leading order in 1 over n match with what you would get from the dual bulk ADS. So let me uh, phrase this in Mellon space uh, uh, and, uh, and then uh, uh, connect it with this approach, which on, at first sight is very different from uh, this, but seems closer to this. So, uh, and so we, uh, so let me uh, sketch that. So, the, um, uh, so let me uh, parameter, let me parameterize this in Mellon space. What do I mean by bulk ADS interactions with local vertices of maximum spin L? Um, in position space, that means. The, there are quartic vertices, so there are uh, these written. Uh, so because there's a Z2 symmetry, he, he, uh, they took a Z2 symmetric case. Uh, for them, their bulk ADS dual had only uh, uh, the bulk ADS dual had only quartic interactions uh, of uh, uh, of these files uh, and. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, and they parameterized the interaction, so you have quartic interactions, so phi, phi, and then some number of derivatives uh, uh, acting on, uh, so you can have various uh, deri uh, derivatives acting on each of these uh, uh, to various powers, 
Uh, so you, and the whole thing contracted uh, uh, to give a scalar. So uh, uh, so you uh, so you have a quartic interaction like this. Let's say. Uh, um, uh, and they impose that the maximum spin uh, that is there is uh, uh, is spin L. So they they try to parameterize all these uh, possible vertices. And for if you impose the constraint that the total spin is uh, is restricted to L, I'll just take a couple of minutes, uh, and then. Uh, 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 there's a finite number of such vertices. Uh, this is actually much, uh, so this is in position space, but in Mellon space, this is much easier to uh, uh, to parameterize. And that has to do with the fact, uh, I didn't mention earlier, that these contact bitten diagrams have a very simple form in Mellon space. Uh, uh, so uh, I told you over here the, the, uh, the form for these exchange Witten diagrams, there there are some complicated ones, but they are meromorphic functions. They have poles, but the contact diagrams are actually just polynomials in S and T uh, because they don't have any poles. Uh, they have only uh, 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 so uh, so they have only double trace contributions which come uh, from there. So these in Mellon space. Uh, uh, correspond to vertices which you can parameterize in Mellon space in a simple way. Um, uh, in terms of some so you want something which is uh, the, these contact diagrams. You want them to be crossing symmetric, uh, uh, and so you can parameterize them by uh, some basic polynomials built from uh, quadratic and quartic invariants from this S and T. So, uh, so once again, so there's you have. Uh, S and T uh, are like uh, Mandelstam variables, as I said. So crossing symmetry interchanges S, T, and you can define a U uh, such that at least up to some shifts, it's uh, equal to zero. So maybe there are some linear shifts, but you can define S, T, and U such that the sum is equal to zero. Uh, 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 so you want to find crossing symmetric combinations and it's easy to because you have the at the linear level uh, there's a uh, uh, they add up to zero you can form essentially quadratic uh, combinations uh, and uh, cubic combinations Uh, uh, so th that's what essentially this i3 and uh, uh, actually it's simpler to work with the following cubic combination, which is just S prime, T prime, U prime, which is what we actually use. The other one can be then expressed in terms of, because you see the other one, ST uh, plus TU plus uh, SU, that because of this relation is not independent from this. And similarly, at the cubic level, all the other cubic invariants are not independent uh, of uh, uh, this. So there are essentially these, and you can parameterize uh, uh, the general amplitude by uh, by uh, uh, by uh, uh, monomials. Uh, by, uh, from starting from these monomials, you built up the general interaction, uh, and uh, uh, this constraint is the, uh, is essentially uh, telling you that the maximum spin is L because you see um, S if you wish. Uh, and like in your usual Mandelstam variables, S doesn't carry any theta dependence, only T and U do. And you see over here, these are quadratic in T and U, this is also quadratic, so the, uh, sorry, L by 2. So the maximum spin from a term like this is, uh, the, the spin from a term like this is M plus N. And so putting the uh, 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 M plus N is uh, the sp uh, uh, is twice the spin. Um, so uh, 
so the uh, putting the total spin less than L is the same as twice n plus m uh, being less than or equal to L. So, uh, so you can parameterize these very uh, 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 simply in Mellon space. And uh, uh, so what Polchinski, et cetera, showed was that for each of these ANMs, you have, a, you have something which satisfies crossing symmetry, uh, and, uh, 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 and uh, uh, you have a solution of the conventional bootstrap equations uh, for each such uh, bulk vertex uh, in the... So this is a solution to the conformal bootstrap equations. Uh, um, so, uh, so just uh, uh, to conclude very quickly, uh, this looks at first sight sort of close to what one is doing over here, but not quite uh, the same because it seems to ha come just from uh, 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 fr uh, from these quartic vertices. And by the way, the anomalous dimensions, the gamma, uh, and the gammas are proportional to they are linear in A and M to leading order in one over n. And uh, 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 because essentially these give you logs, the, in the, these are the terms which give you logs uh, when you, in, in the, the Witten diagrams that give you logs and tell you the leading anomalous dimension. Uh, uh, so you get a solution. So in this approach, you get the anomalous dimensions purely from the logs that come from uh, these quartic diagrams. But uh, that's different from how you do things here in this uh, approach, but quite miraculously, uh, they both agree. So, uh, so now if you instead uh, plus the T plus the U plus you put in the same kind of A and M's, uh, and but here allow. Uh, the double trace operators, these uh, these double trace operators, to be exchanged, um, and so the dimensions of anomalous dimensions appear uh, uh, directly in in these exchange Witten diagrams, and you demand that the spurious poles cancel. Once again, you find that the logs that you sort of get from these spurious poles cancel with this A and M in such a way that the anomalous dimension comes out to be exactly the same. So what uh, I'm saying here is that the, there's, an, the, there's an alternate, and you can show this in general, that this works very generally. So the usual bootstrap uh, constraints, which are written in terms of the crossing symmetric equations, can be written in a crossing invariant way and in which you impose this sum over the spurious poles uh, cancellation condition, and you find that uh, the solution to the conformal boot, the, the, the usual solution that you get from the conformal bootstrap uh, agrees with this way of organizing the uh, ADS, uh, uh, the ADS diagrams, uh, uh, dual to the original CFT. So there's a, some sense in which you can view the ADS dual either in this way or in in this in this way. Uh, and uh, I don't know from the bulk point of view, this is to leading order in one over n. I don't know how this will generalize. Uh, uh, to the higher orders in one over n, and people have started looking at loops and so on. So uh, it would be interesting to see how this uh, goes uh, goes over. But this is this firstly shows the consistency with the uh, that there are essentially uh, this Mellon bootstrap captures the same information as the usual crossing symmetric uh, for formulation, and moreover, it tells you the need for in general, having these contact terms to get a consistent uh, solution uh, uh, for the bootstrap. If you didn't, you would not be able to satisfy the conditions uh, uh, over here and get a non-trivial answer. So, so okay, let me stop uh, right now. Thanks.
any questions so suppose uh, you start with the cft and you do all this calculation in the position space uh, and you expand this conformer block there we know that the cft data is like cft data is uh, this uh, spectrum and the three point coefficients only yeah. so there we don't uh, means even if there we don't have a four point vertex still this will uh, means still one can show that in the written in position space you mean in I mean, the usual uh, conformal block uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which uh, approach i means usual conformal block approach means just in the position space means uh, not doing this melin transform but when uh, we do uh, position melin space is convenient but uh, the uh, uh, the idea is equally would have been true in position space as well. Uh, so when you say position space, do you mean the usual conformal crossing yeah. equations in positions? Yeah, yeah, yes. So yes. there anyway, you don't talk about Witten diagrams or anything. You write in terms of these blocks and then you say the S channel is equal to the T channel. Uh, 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 so that's what they do over here. Um, but what uh, these people showed was that usual conformal block uh, crossing equation uh, can be uh, captured equally well by looking at a bulk ADS in which the vertices are purely quartic vertices and you find a one is to one. So there's a family of CFTs which are sort of, um, at this level at least just solutions of the crossing equations parameterized by these uh, ANMs um, and uh, 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 and uh, uh, for each uh, such uh, bulk ADS, you get exactly the anomalous dimensions uh, from the bulk point of view, uh, as what the crossing symmetry equation here would give you. So here, in this, uh, this they did it in position space, and they they, they I said it here in. Melon space, but uh, their approach is purely in the position space. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so they showed this, and they worked it out at least to the first, uh, first leading order in 1 over n, and for the first few spins explicitly. Towards the end of the talk, you just made a, you made a statement about uh, a miraculous uh, thing happening uh, when you so, take these two approaches together. So I didn't quite understand what that... Yeah, so, uh, so the, at first sight, uh, well, I mean, um, we understand mathematically where this miracle is coming from, but I think uh, a better understanding is needed. So uh, let me forget about this side uh, and just focus on what Polchinski did, uh, et cetera, did in the bulk. So what they said was that, um, supposing you have a bulk ADS theory uh, in which you have just the scalar phi and it's only interactions, so you have a kinetic term for phi, and then you have bulk vertices of this kind, which translate in melon space to some polynomials. Uh, but uh, let's say we work in position space. So, so, so in ADS, uh, there's one picture in which you have uh, only mm, uh, quartic vertices uh, of various kinds, uh, the, uh, this kind, and, um, and you want to compute, let's say, anomalous dimensions in that theory, like in the usual ADS shift. So each of these are proportional to some 1 over n square, and then uh, uh, you, uh, you want to, uh, to calculate the anomalous dimensions. What do you do? There's a well-defined procedure. You, uh, you extract the logs. Uh, which come from these contact terms, and then those correspond to the uh, anomalous dimensions of the operators, uh, of these double trace operators that you built from these phi's. That's how you uh, get the, uh, 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 th that's the standard ADS CFT prescription. So here what you do, you're not cancelling out anything, you're just expanding out, and these terms are proportional something times, let's say, log u, or, and then you, uh, 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 and the anomalous dimensions, you, uh, uh, you read off from this uh, coefficients, which will be therefore proportional to these arbitrary coefficients a and m. Okay, so that's one side. But in, in the approach, in the Mellon bootstrap approach, we uh, are proposing, uh, you do, you, uh, even in the ADS, so to say, side, what you're doing is something quite different. I mean, it has the, uh, you 
phrase it in the language of ADS written diagrams, but, uh, but you're doing something different because what you do is you sum over all delta and L, like I said over here, uh, with some uh, OPE coefficients, uh, the C tilde delta L. So you sum over all this. Uh, that paper, there was assumption that no single trace exchange is being done. Just all the operators are there. Exactly. There's no other single. So, 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 so these diagrams also, will just vanish, right? Uh, so here, no. Here, delta and L, in our approach, it's over all primaries, so which include double trace primaries as well. Oh, OK, OK. So, uh, so that's what uh, here, the sum is over all primaries. Because in general, in a general CFT, there's no distinction between single trace and double trace. So here you, in this approach, you take, but you take only this set of primaries, namely the double trace operators. So there's a sum over delta n and l, and you sum over these, and you add a Witten diagram corresponding to that, and demand that the spurious poles cancel. Now, where do the anomalous dimensions come from? Uh, so the spurious poles essentially correspond to these logs. So now here, instead of reading off the anomalous dimensions from the question of the log, here you are demanding that the logs cancel. Mm. So the logs from here cancel with the logs from here. So, so the anomalous dimensions, which initially came directly from here, in this approach, they cancel off from the contribution here, but lead therefore to the same condition. Mm. The gammas are uh, the gammas will enter here in the bulk to bulk propagators, and that uh, will be leads to the same proportionality to the gamma. So in this way, you are cancelling the logs. In this way, you are only keeping the logs. Uh, so, but so the, the two give rise to the same set of solutions for the crossing equations. And I must say that. The general anomalous dimension is some complicated linear combination of this, and it has dependence on all the n's and l's, so it's quite non-trivial that it should agree. So in the Mellon space, the first approach would be, instead of cancelling the uh, residue of the double poles, you are just reading it off. Yeah, in From this there. approach, yeah. Okay, and it just happens to match here that. Yeah. But uh, if it is a mathematical matching, uh, you don't expect, it's not so trivial, no, meaning it's obvious that uh, hmm. it goes higher order in n also? Uh, well, one, uh, uh, firstly, yeah, you, uh, you, uh, at higher orders in N, this approach becomes more complicated. You add in the loops and uh, and so on, and Alde and collaborators and Aharoni and so on, they have uh, um, uh, done this. Uh, it, it's, um, it is, I think, a task to check how this works. I think that will give you a better sense for how this works uh, when you do it at higher orders. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, so I think uh, that, but that's something we haven't uh, checked. But I think it would be interesting to understand in general because that's what's different from the usual ADS CFT approach, at least here, that you uh, you you are cancelling off these log terms. But somehow the cancellation is the same as uh, just reading off the anomalous dimensions in the usual approach. Um, Rajesh, so like for example, when we're doing beta function calculations, sometimes you can read off the beta function by looking at the coefficient of the divergences. Though you know like, of course, all the UV divergences you cancel by counter terms and really you should uh, do a more uh, this thing, especially at higher orders. But yeah. at leading order, you know, you can just read, off. is it something like that? It's uh, in spirit. It's uh, similar in, in what you say, but uh, 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 but the exact analogy I don't quite see. Uh, to uh, because here, yeah, maybe there's a way to view it in that way because these logs are. Um, yeah, I have to think. Uh, but I, uh, it's true that it's sort of in a similar spirit, at least. This polynomial ambiguity that you talk about in your paper, which is essentially this contact term. Yeah, these. So, uh, what would one have to do to fix it? I mean, is there a notion of fixing it or? Yeah, so that's a good question and that's something we are, uh, I didn't talk about at all, but we are trying to, uh, in this particular case, actually there wasn't even, you couldn't even fix it because there was a whole family of CFTs yeah. parameterized by this and that's just what it is yeah. because that's what they showed that 
for any a and m, you will get a solution at least to leading order in the crossing equation. Now, of course, th this is a very restrictive. They they put in a lot of restrictions here. There are no. Uh, they didn't look at other operators, so on. So in general, when you do that, these a and m's will very likely get fixed. Uh, uh, so the um, uh, from uh, yeah uh, from looking at all possible exchange operators and so on. So. Uh, uh, so in general, it should get fixed. But here was an example where, yeah. uh, uh, within these restrictions, it's not because they, it's like an effective theory. I guess that's yeah. All. Uh, here, these are effective theories which are not constrained, at least at this level. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so you you have the same freedom. You have, in a sense, a family of CFTs, and they are parameterized by these. Coefficient. If one were to take the approach that all quartic vertices would come from integrating out something, yeah, and then exchange so then, interaction. Uh, they then must be really, so for the Ising model, or this, uh, there must be a specific set of um, uh, contact terms. But but can't everything be just included in the exchange diagrams? Uh, not necessarily, uh, because the equations can, uh, are not consistent with just that's what. This example was useful for us to see explicitly. If you just set this to zero, you wouldn't have a consistent solution to the, or rather, you'll have only the trivial solution to the uh, anomalous dimension because these, there's nothing for the logs here to cancel against. But that would probably mean that you would, in order to get the same solution, you would have to add something, some operator which is heavy. Yeah, which will generate this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I mean, just without even the, without even considering the contact term, just working with the exchange interaction, and and just sufficiently expanding your answers to include some heavy operators, one should be able to produce this theory. Right? Um, yeah, it, yeah. At some level, I mean, it depends on what you mean by the exchange, because some of the contact terms you can hide in the in the exchange definition of the. Uh, exchange diagram. That's like saying there's always a cubic string field theory or something like that, uh, uh, which I don't know. There might be subtleties there. Uh, because if you think of the bulk point of view, that's like saying that it's a purely cubic uh, theory, which may not be true in general for a closed, uh, a closed string theory. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? What is the n here? Uh, is there a gauge symmetry? I, you said there's just a scalar field. No, the n is just used as a way to suppress the double trace contributions, higher uh -huh. uh, tree diagrams, and so on. It's just the usual. In the from the bulk point of view, it is just viewed as an G Newton. Uh, so it's only there is no from that point of view uh, for large n factorization. Uh, there's no uh, assumption here that there's some underlying gauge theory. You're asking about the Himskak, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's thank Rajesh again and let's break for coffee.